Achtung, Achtung, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland. And James is in a state of um, extreme excitement. Yeah, the smell of that. I'm smelling lino, aren't you? And kind of sort of, yeah. you know, metal and... Where are we, Jim? Yeah, we're in the Churchill War Rooms. We're, we're underneath Whitehall. We've got steel girders above us and beyond that, extra dollops of concrete. Yeah, and we're here with uh, Nigel Steele, who's a senior historian here. That's right. Um, and Nigel, I mean... Did the, but just judging by the look on James's face, you might. Do you love working here? You oh might. yeah, it's great. No, this is and this is uh, great. I, I work here. I work at HMS Belfast, and one of the most magical things about being in a place like this, which you can't replicate anywhere else, is the smell. Yeah. Mm. And I know that's what you're breathing in. I can see you're all breathing deep. Yeah. As it comes in and out, and the same thing happens in HMS Belfast. It's all smelly places because it's the smell of history. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what is that smell? It is lino, but it's and dust, isn't it? Because, well, not like dust, because it it's looks immaculate. I don't want to. It's the chairs, the felt, and in fact, when you were in here, if you'd have been in here in 1940, 41, fog of this smoke. would have been absolutely it's appalling. Smoke. Because, well, yeah. you've got your you've got your um, ashtrays, ashtrays laid everywhere. out everywhere. You've got ashtrays, you've got cigars, cigarettes, pipes. They're all pumping through, and the whole yeah. place will be full of smoke. And you can see running around the ceiling here. Yes. This is like a kind of like you get through ships getting it pumped through. <laughs> yes. This isn't air conditioning. This is just metal trunking bringing air all the way to Westminster from Horsbury Road. Really? It, it did about three quarters of a mile in a metal tube from the foggy, foggy, uh, polluted streets of London, sucked in here and pumped out here. If you put a handkerchief in there, it will go black. <laughs> and oh so that's your fresh air. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't doing much to help you, but that's the best you've got. And, and in fact, this became the cabinet room when they extended that metal trunking right. in October 1939, because originally the cabinet room had been in what became Churchill's bedroom, but it was too small. Yeah. So, so they, all, they all survived the war here and then promptly kind of came a cropper from lung so, disease. So what, we, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what we have here is we have a square table with two, four, six, eight, ten. How many, how many sit around the... Rather than me the, counting the, 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 the war cabinet had about six, eight members in it, and then you've got these three key tables in the middle which face the Prime Minister for the Chiefs of Staff. And I always think it looks a bit like... A trial. Or naughty boys who've been before yeah. the headmaster, I yeah. think. And so there's definitely a confrontation going on here, and you feel that conflict and the tension between them. But the key seat is this one, this wooden chair here. And what's amazing about this wooden chair is that you can actually see in the arms, and if you come and have a look here, yeah. this yeah. is Churchill's mark. Where it's been worn. He, he was so powerful. He so, I always think the extent of his charisma is that he sat here with his signet ring on his right hand, banging away. And he is literally grooved into the chair. And over here, he did it with his fingernails. So this is the texture of charisma and power still ingrained well, in Churchill's chair at the head of this table. And the pressure. The pressure and the tension. and Because it's certainly the, the first couple of years... There's lots of reasons to, I mean, it's amazing he has any fingernails, really, the, the first couple of years, you know, certainly till late 42. Um, so, so, so we're talking, which order do the chiefs of staff sit in? I, I, I don't we think it's that order, but the, the three chiefs, so there's the three services. Yeah. Well, what we do know is then surrounding the prime minister is here on the left sat Clement Attlee, yep. so mm -hmm. leader of the Labour Party, what effectively from 1942, deputy prime minister. Yep. yep. Very clever move on Churchill's part to create this all-party coalition. On the other side sat Sir Edward Bridges, who, who was uh, the cabinet secretary. And then you got uh, Sir Hastings Ismay, who was effectively mm -hmm. Churchill's chief of staff. Yeah, yeah. So he's his military advisor. He's basically. a military advisor and became one of the chiefs of staff and was the coordination liaison between the prime minister and the chief of staff. And, the chief and, of staff, and right from the word go as well, from right 1939. From the right from the beginning. So, uh, so when Churchill becomes Prime Minister in May 1940, he does a very clever thing. And he creates himself the Minister of Defence. So he's in charge of the three service ministers and is the one who is able to then direct the policy. But he has to sign it off effectively and get the agreement because the orders are then issued by the chiefs of staff. So a very delicate balance, very clever, because it allows them to bounce off against each other and stop each one from making mistakes. Yes, yeah, so it, it, it makes it uh, a commi committee process, doesn't it? Yeah. But with him still in charge? Uh, I think you know. probably he does have the ascendancy. Yeah. Um, but he cannot issue a direct order to the armed services and make them do something. It has to come from the chief of staff. Well, it's, it's, it's got to be Brook. In, it's got to be Alan Brook in the middle, hasn't well, it? Well, I think it's probably Brook in the middle. But 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 is the army? It, you know, we've talked about this an awful lot, Jim. What's the ascend, the service in the ascendant really? 
is the Royal Navy. They're yes, the, but he's they're, the they're, chief of the Imperial General Staff, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. Well, and it's not, not so much that. It's just that by the, from, I think, 1942 onwards, he is the chairman of the Chief of Staff Committee. Yeah, yeah. So he, he is the chair of the three of them. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's actually the, that's actually the... That makes him yeah. the and top And they, they rotate through. So it was the army's turn. He just happens to inherit it. Right, right, so, right, right. So, so, Which is why he's CIGS. Well, at CIGS, it's the army's turn, and and next time it would be the turn of one of the other services. Oh, I see what you yeah, mean. So, right. so he's inherited it. So, so he becomes from the middle of the war the chairman of the chief of staff committee, and basically drives it through. And we are extremely lucky to have the historical document of his highly outspoken diary. Yeah, which yes. gives us a really good insight into those tensions that we can see. Through this conversational layer. I mean, this is, I mean really, because really, I've looked at this room through the glass, obviously, and I've known what it is, but to be in here, how confrontational this seat layer is, especially as there's, there's people sat behind the chiefs of staff. So, uh, so you know, a look could go round the room behind them without, or a note be passed round behind them, but that the, the, they're unaware of even. And, uh, you know, it's, just a, it's, got, it's got a kind of star chamber feel, hasn't it? It has, yeah. I know, but it, it, but it shows almost like where that creative tension comes from. Yeah. Uh, and I think constitutionally, it's a good situation yeah. because they do have to work together. Yeah. Um, and that creates a, a kind of balance between the strategic caution and the vision that you get from Churchill. And you need Churchill's vision to be unchecked and you need a bit of energy and dynamism being put into the chiefs of staff. And Well, and quite a lot of, no, we can't do that. Well, I, that's, is, what I, that's what I mean. Which the, is the Brooks, kind of, that, yeah. Brooks' role very much, very often, is to say, I'm really sorry, that's impossible. Or if we do that, you know, it'll disrupt the other thing you want to do. And uh, uh, I mean, which, uh, as you say, the diaries, the diaries are extraordinary for that. Yeah. And, and how much Brooks venting rather than relaying what maybe really happened, we don't, we'll never really know quite. But But it's obviously central to... How this room works. So who so who else is in here? Who who is around the rest of the table? There are other members of the cabinet. Um, the, well, principally the war cabinet. It's laid yeah. out possibly for a full cabinet, but mostly it's used by the war cabinet. Yeah. So the full um, cabinet is about thirty people, isn't it? So the war uh, cabinet, it's, cabinet yeah, probably is, not quite that size, but it, yeah, getting on for that number. It's, it's big. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, um, but but in in the war, it goes from five in nineteen forty to oh. about. About eight, 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 I, I, I think, think by, by 1945. So you've got Anthony Eden, obviously. Yeah. Um, you've got um, uh, Oliver Greenwood, uh, haven't you? And no, no, um, so they're, they're, you're going to have a chancellor. So yeah, yeah. Um, and so I mean, it, it Kingsley Wood. Yeah. Yep. I think that it depends what date you're taking them from because they they change to a certain extent. But but it's what it's one of these things where that's a powerful body. But the interesting thing is that we look at this and they only really come down here into the, uh, the the cabinet war rooms at times of great threat. So they're here from 4041 and they come back again in 44 when the V weapons arrive. Right, yeah. Between that time, Churchill doesn't like being down underground because he thinks it's a little bit cowardly and hiding away from the enemy. So he goes back up and he goes back to places like Church House, to mm -hmm. the House of the Common. He uses the Admiralty Parliament. a bit, doesn't he? He's, yeah. he's used the Admiralty at the beginning and various different things. So he looks for other spaces. But when the V1 comes and then the V2, that puts London directly under random threat again, and they come back down here, and the cabinet war rooms has a resurgence from the cabinet point of view. But what people right. seem, seem to think that the cabinet meeting is the purpose of the, the cabinet war rooms, but in fact, it was almost more for the chiefs of staff and their subcommittee, so the joint planning staff and the joint intelligence staff, who come down here and work in here as well. And so this, as an establishment, it's as much about the chiefs of staff as it is about the cabinet. So the cabinet, war cabinet comes here to convene to meet with the JIC and as it were, or to, to, yes. to interface interface with that part of the, 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 the war bureaucracy or the war Yeah, the, 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 the staffs of the chiefs of staff, so the intelligence committee, the planning committee, yeah. they live here. Right. They're here all the time, 24 seven. And if you go into what is now the Churchill Museum, that whole area was a series of small offices set up between the girders that you can see and the bigger uprights. And that was divided up into a whole series of offices. And they lived here um, and needed to be here because they were tied to the map room. Yeah. And I suggest if we move yes. along, we go down to the map room yeah. and have a look at that. I'd, I'd just like to just to describe this a little bit more because, because Al, you were saying it's a sort of, it's a big square table. That suggests it's some huge, great, massive kind of, I don't know, sort of mahogany thing. And it's not, it's, it's sort of effectively like sort of camping tables, trestle tables put together. Yeah. Uh, and it's shoved together in a kind of sort of, in, in a glorified extra horseshoe and it's all been kind of sort of there's lots of tables 
shoved together, sort of a bit like a village hall, and then covered in felt. Is this the original felt? As far as we know, yes. It's the original felt. And, and it's sort of been sort of glued, stapled onto these, these tables. You've then got, just in front of Churchill's seat, you, you've got, you've got his, his red governmental um, dispatch box with the Right Honourable Winston S. Churchill stamped on it and a Barbados sticker. Um, <laughs> you've got maps all over the place. And above you, you have got these whopping great girders, haven't you? I mean, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly atmospheric place. The, the, quite the, regardless the girders of the... come in at the, at the end of 1938 when they realise right. after the Munich crisis they need to strengthen them a little bit. So they have another resurgence at the beginning, end of 38 into 39, and they bring the metal girders into areas where they can. Um, the wooden struts have already been put in, and we'll see those in the map room. Yep. But what I think is quite nice about these is this comes, this is high quality British steel from before the war that comes from Middlesbrough. It's the same steel that built the Tyne Bridge and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Amazing. Wonderful. W what's this little control here? That, that, I think, is to call for the secretaries. Right. So that if you want to call somebody in to come and bring you a paper or get your map or something like that, you call somebody in. There would have been people around the edge, but they would have been minuting. So if you needed someone from outside, you would call for somebody who would come in, um, be told either by Bridges or uh, Ismay what they wanted, and then they would go off and bring it into the meeting. I knew someone who worked here, actually, um, a lady called Wendy Maxwell, who was uh, one of um, um, uh, Ismay's um, secretaries. And so she was down here a lot and was one of those people sort of on the other end of that, that little buzzer. And uh, she was with him pretty much the whole war and all the way through and then went to Nuremberg as well, as well as all the kind of the big conferences in the war. And, and, and Hastings Ismay is a really interesting guy because he's sort of, in a way, he's the kind of interface between between Churchill, isn't he, and, and the Chiefs of Staff and the military. And, and, they, and he's got under him, he's got sort of Leo Hollis and but he's, Ian Jacob but, but and he's, people. But isn't yes. he Chamberlain's Chief of Staff, though? So uh, uh, pre-war. So yep. it's, it's Chamberlain's advice that infu informs all the Munich he, uh, negotiation decisions. At that uh, time, Ismay's advice. he was an Assistant Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defence. That's right. Um, and so he's kind of requisitioned forward. Um, he, he's propelled forward to take control of that area when Hankey finally yeah. uh, retires, um, just before the war. And so he's not in quite the same position with Chamberlain, uh, and Churchill needs a chief of staff because of the way he's going to operate. So I think that role exists from the time that Churchill changes the structure in May 1940. So Nigel, in this room, given the, the time frame you've told us this, this room was being used, what, what kind of big decisions would have gone across this desk? I think what you principally are watching here is the defense of Britain against the Blitz right. and then against the V weapons attacks. Okay. So the issues, that, the historic issues surrounding the other decisions are floating around and being discussed on a regular basis. But the principal things is how well are ARP going? How are they sticking it out? Are they going to survive? And I think that is what you get from here is because they come into this room when they're under severe pressure from above the ground, that what this represents is the kind of tenacity and determination of Britain to prevail against German attack. We need to take a break right now. We'll be back after these propaganda messages from the world of capitalism. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. So where are we now, Nigel? Uh, this is the map room. This is my favourite room. This is by far the most important part of the whole setup because this is like today we're used to constant 24 hour news feeds. You can yep. watch a screen and have your main thing, you have a banner headline at the bottom, somebody talking about a third thing. This is the equivalent of that level of news information. This was constantly updated, constantly buzzing to make sure that everybody who worked here in the cabinet war rooms had as up to date a touch and a feel on the pulse of the war as you could possibly get. Yeah. And that was because information flowed in through these telephones, was processed and then put onto map form. So that if you were Ismay or whoever, you could come along at any time of the day or night and see what was the most reliable bit of information about what was happening in the war. And that was done here in this room. And it was manned 24 seven from the end of August 39 to August 1945. No lights went out constantly being updated. It's like a brain ticking away. And Absolutely. to me, it's a, it's a fascinating kind of way in which the war is basically controlled. So there's a long desk, 
that the, the house is sort of uh, five people. There's a dozen telephones. There's the map room at the end. Behind behind me is a state, London Red, um, aircraft approaching, uh, where they're coming from. So the coast of the southeast, aircraft casualties. So so you absolutely, you fl that's the information flow of the Battle of Britain right there. And what you basically got is a series of big maps on the wall. So you've got convoy maps, You've got another naval map over there. These are air operations maps. And then you've got the big map for the war against the Japanese. And next door in the annex is a, is a huge map of Eastern Europe. So all running all the way, basically, from, well, almost from Western to Eastern Europe, where it runs all the way from Stalingrad to Berlin, back to Normandy. And that's where the war in Europe was, was maintained and recorded. And so information comes in through here. The telephones were always known as the beauty chorus because they were always um, singing. <laughs> um, but they they're different, different colours. I mean, we've got, it's not just sort of black bakelite here. Different, the got, different colour, the different green, colors. cream, black, red. They they indicate whether they're they're going where they're going to. So they go to the three service ministries and the Ministry of Home Security. They go to Downing Street. They're scramble phones. If you have a look, there's no yep. dial on it, yeah. so they're direct lines. Um, and the cream one, I think, from here goes across to Downing Street. So it's it's a direct connection with all the sources of information you are going to need here. And it also works from across the building. You see the pneumatic tubes behind you there. Yeah, I love those. I just noticed yeah. those. So that, there's that, a message that, tubes on That's sending from around this building. The whole building, the whole of the government building, the treasury building as it is today, was a war headquarters. But this bit underground was the real hub. And, and this is another tri-service room, or at least yes. the mannequins represent the, that. The, yeah. the, you had a duty officer from each of the services and then you had the one in charge who was running it all. And right. they, they did four shifts a day. So there was the same number of people were manning it 24 seven. And then there were other people to keep updating the maps. At the time, obviously it was slightly larger because you didn't have the glass protection. And so, but it was also supposed to be much brighter, which is why you have the visor on the desk to stop you getting too bright. So here it's dark because it's conservation, yeah. but it would have been much brighter so you could see everything yeah. in there. And it, this really is the sense to me of, the war happening still. And there's a wonderful description from Ismay. He said that coming into the map room is like going to visit a friend of yours in hospital, that you went to the hospital hoping for the best, but fearing the worst. And that's what you found when you came in here. And I get that you think you get that sense all the time. Yeah, yeah. What I love about this fact is it, it, the way it's been left is incredibly busy. There's lots of papers everywhere. There's, there's sort of buff coloured folders, JIC situation report. That's, of course, the Joint Intelligence Committee, most secret. But that's a, obviously a genuine one. You've got here on the RAF uh, um, chap's desk, you've got regulations for the release of RAF personnel. There's a little sort of shelf of, a little sort of slat of books. The British Imperial Calendar and Civil Service List. You know, it's all sort of real, genuine stuff from that period, and it, and it gives it a an incredible sense of um, well, and, sort of being in the moment. And lots it? of ashtrays again. And lots <laughs> of ashtrays, but also three sugar lumps. Yeah. Three sugar lumps. The, the, these were the property of Wing Commander John Hegarty, who was the duty officer sitting here at the desk the day the war the, uh, the map room closed, and he'd been sent these by his wife, and he kept them in his top drawer. And he used, you can see where he scrapes off the sugar so he can eke it out over the cup because sugar was highly rationed. And so these three sugar lumps were found by the museum when we came in to catalogue this in the 1980s. Uh, and it's on Hegarty's desk. And so we know that these are Hegarty's sugar lumps. And it's one of those things that puts a direct line yeah. straight, straight my, away back to 1945. My God, how amazing. Yeah, isn't that brilliant? Isn't I it brilliant? It. Well, well, Nigel, thank you so much for this little tour of the Churchill War Rooms. Um, it's the most fascinating place. and um, It really is. Don't, don't, don't you want to achieve it? I want to achieve it at home now. Yeah, I do. I want to cheer. From, yeah. from my house to kind of, you to know, tell the teenager to come downstairs for lunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I want a little sort of message. Something kind of pop. Kind of like out. Yeah. 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 No, thanks, Nigel. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll see you again soon. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.